um, the entire findings of my PhD in one slide. I challenge other PhD students to <laughs> pull that off. And it's 30 words, I believe it was, without the reference. But um, the guts of it, the round the outside is what you do. And the answer is you use a systems change approach to dealing with racism. But we identified 10 sites of racism and how they make policy and, and, um, and how they do funding. Of course, there's more than that. There's different ones that are happen in HR processes and there's different ones that happen in service delivery. But each of these sites of racism are places where you can do an intervention to disrupt it. So it looks kind of depressing and some of it looks familiar. Oh, it's good that it's self-explanatory. I used to spend a lot of time explaining this side, but the point is there's just these places where it all goes wrong. And if you drill down, like this one's spectacular, this one here, just to pick a random one. So I looked at 10 years of health policy and looked at who was being cited. And I think if I remember right, there's a footnote in the PhD, I think it's like about 10 Māori academics in 10 years got cited in all of the health policy. And 80% of that was references to Mason Jury's work in Fire Order. So they're simply not looking at what Māori academics have to say about health. And so they're developing policy that's relying on, on biomedical stuff from the global north and ignoring the global south and ignoring indigenous folk. So that's a fundamental problem. If we changed that point, you could change a whole lot of stuff around policy. Or if you changed how we, how we brought public health services. Yeah, I can explain any of that if we want to go, but that's just that you're getting a sense. Heather might be the one to go Which back to after we've done that group oh, work as well. You're welcome to, him. because you might have different ones in your area, because it's really quite interesting to think about and map the racism in your area and then think about how can you, is there places there that you can do things? Because I think that this one here, inconsistent practice, and we've had a paper published earlier this year in Social Science and Medicine which showed how Māori health providers are treated differently from the public health units, from primary health care organisations and from other non-governmental organisations. Statistically significant findings, and I'm not a quantitative researcher, so that was a big day when we found that. But you could write a memo and say this is our practice and how we look after contracts and put it in a place where everyone can see and if they follow those, uh, their own rules and we're consistent that side of racism would be gone tomorrow. I'm happy to draft that memo. It would take me less than an hour and we could get rid of that side of racism. So once you get really specific, it's that straightforward, I believe. It doesn't have to be hard if there's the political will to make it happen. Oh, this is Grant again because he does the best sound bites. And in public health, I, I think you start from a place of of like your whānau, your family, we kind of know one another, we've got a shared value base. And so these people aren't trying to be racist, the people that are writing public health policy in New Zealand, and we do know them. We would go drinking with them at conferences. But this thing that, that Grant's saying is that they, they're not meaning to be racist, but my goodness me, they are. And by allowing things to happen and not disrupting it. So it's challenging for those that choose to be in the big institutions, but there's still a responsibility on them. Oh, that was going to be a demonstration, but we're not doing that. There's um, Malcolm, because you know, he's pretty cool. <laughs> and doesn't it make sense that you would need a plan, that it's not organically going to happen overnight and we turn up the next day and racism's gone? We need a plan. This is our little posse. Oh, see, so that's our revised date, maybe. We're still talking about <laughs> it. Seems quite soon, but... So there's our group, and so there's our line in the sand, and so this is the backbone of the crew that are making it happen. You'll see that's the smallest. We've got a little Facebook presence. If anyone wants to become one of the crew, you can join our secret closed group, and we, can, um, you, we do calls to action, and we share information about racism and whatnot, if you want to join us. So there's our gang. So it's a mixture of Māori and non-Māori. It's a mixture of academics and it's a mixture of senior practitioners. And we've probably got, well, hundreds of years of experience of public health between us. I think the most junior member of our crew has been working in public health maybe 15 years. So it's lots of senior folk that are completely committed. 
there's some of the gang. Mm -hmm. We had a um, symposium. We had a, started with a budget of $40 or something, and then we <laughs> pulled it off. It was a bit epic. <laughs> Got the T-shirt. Should have worn the T-shirt today, probably. But um, it was great. We, we turned people away. Everyone wanted to come and talk about racism. It was a little surreal. But we're in the business of planting ideas. Very subversive, <laughs> isn't it? We plant ideas and hope for ripples and things to happen. That's just, you would expect that slide, really. Because um, ending racism isn't about an individual superstar. And I'm not an individual superstar, I'm part of a posse of people. And I always say I don't think it's good practice to work alone. It's short-sighted and it's bad for your health. And you need a little posse of buddies to do it. Whether they're a virtual group because there isn't enough safe people in your organisation, whether it's a virtual one where you've got people from away that stand with you. Don't take on the institution by yourself, you'll just get the whack. And we'd rather you stayed in for the long term rather than did a short term spectacular burnout situation. So this is um, the special amoeba model. Everyone familiar with the amoeba model? Just me. <laughs> oh. Well, there's different spots to affect change. So there's the radical folk that are doing fringe things that are cutting edge. There's the people that explain what those people on the edge are doing, which is really important. I've sometimes gone places without the translator and that was a mistake. These are these people that, that are quite keen to do something, so once they get some advice about what to do, they're on board. Like if you tell them what to do, they're in, and these people will do it when they have to do it. And these people are just completely off target. They're not ever going to be with us. And I've needed this bit myself from my mates about manakitanga. So there's the job of looking after the people that are doing the work. And Honey's one of the manakitanga people. He holds me together. And so that's valuable work. So it's recognising that looking after people is political work. And making the art is political work. So there's a spot for all of us, depending on what our personality styles, our skill set is. There's different spots to do the business. Make sense? Look, I've got you all recruited. You've all got your own spots now. <laughs> so this is what we've been doing. This, we've written this up in a paper. So Stu's been kind of doing a five-pronged approach, which feels a little mad, but we've been mobilising people. So we've probably got 250 supporters now. So we could call on them. If they all came, were on there in the same place in the same day, that would be kind of mad. We would be at a bit of a loss. So we've been mobilising people, so we've probably done over 100 talks about institutional racism and decolonisation in the last five years. We've been promoting treaty-based practice about working with Te Tiriti, and in the next, before Christmas, surely, our um, e-book's coming out about how to work with the Māori text and the Māori articles of the Te Tiriti for health promotion practitioners. So not just saying the empty rhetoric of this is what we should do, giving people information and support to help them and we're hoping to pull off a training program to go with that to help people. We write submissions, they're often very long and articulate and they have to ring us up to ask to clarify something because they don't necessarily understand what we're saying. <laughs> and we've been developing policies, we developed the first um, institutional racism policy for our um, public health association in the world, we've persuaded some other people <coughs> to sign on to that. And it gives them clear, it makes them commit publicly to what action they're going to take around institutional racism. We've been doing a whole lot of research looking at both where are the empirical sites of racism where, and how does it work, but also theorising around anti racism practice. So, what do we know about what works? So, not trying to just describe it, but trying to be of practical use to support people. And of course the context in, in the New Zealand set setting is that a whole lot of, um, right now, the health-related Waitangi Tribunal claims are coming up before the Waitangi Tribunal in the next few years. And so it's lots of that stuff's going to help inform people's claims to inform their settlement stuff to help them get some justice from, from the government, which is pretty exciting. And uh, unexpectedly, because you, know, you saw how many people were on that list in, we monitor the government. So every five years we do a survey of all of the public health providers 
and we report on their experiences of their funders, we collate that and then we expose the racism. And we're doing, we're doing, when a new policy document comes out, if we get motivated and have the capacity at the time, we write a damning critique of it, showing how it's going to increase inequalities and showing how racist it is. And so lots of that work's been used in classrooms and in other places so that people, it helps as tools for people to help unravel what's going on. So we're kind of being translators. Yeah. So that's what we've been trying to do, and that's our, been our contributions to this mahi. And this is just a paper that got rejected. Those who follow me on Take Facebook that. will know. Damn it, that paper got rejected. It's a very good paper. It will it get published. It three C's in it. Like, how could the three C's. Yeah. Courage, credentials, and credibility. I mean, that's just the best paper. Catchy. <laughs> it's catchy. It's, it's, and this, this paper's talking about what happens when senior Māori and Pacific leaders get in, the, in, a, in a Crown, get in a government advisory group. And that's the key themes, but it's just fascinating that people talked about how literally you can be in the room and you can say something as clearly as I'm speaking now, and the minute taker writes nothing down until the white person speaks. So there's some really shocking things that are happening that we just need to cease and desist. The white people in the room should not allow that to happen. The people that are running that room it shouldn't be happening and it shouldn't be distressing and people having to emotionally prepare to go to a government advisory group. And yes, some people will navigate that space well and get what they want from that, but there's this ugly underbelly that we need to get sorted. This is another paper we wrote, but I'm not going to talk about that. This is our most ambitious paper probably. It was a bit cheeky. We didn't have a national action plan to end racism in New Zealand, so me and Tim wrote one. And so there's four pathways. And obviously we, we are committed to constitutional transformation, but for some reason we didn't remember to write that specifically in this paper because we have written in the paper before that and the paper after that and it just slipped. But know that that's important. But this is talking about engaging communities 